good to get back to the role of uh, giving these messages. And uh, I was, uh, it was nice to see Pearl leading. And, uh, and then little Claire comes running up and she wants to climb on the podium and then maybe she wants to lead. So she's following your footsteps, Pearl. <laughs> Um, when you prayed for Manipur, I was just thinking, uh, <clears throat> just uh, this week or the week before, I got a, one of those videos that you mentioned, so many videos keep going. And this video was, uh, I think, a Muslim man trying to tell Christians, why is it that you don't do something about what's happening in Manipur? Uh, he was saying that you should not keep quiet as Christians because Christians are affected mostly, as we know. Uh, of course, other people also are affected. And he says, uh, if you keep quiet, then you are not doing your job as a Christian. And he was sort of scolding us as disciples of Jesus for probably not being visible and doing something about uh, Manipur. And then I thought to myself, are we not doing anything about Manipur? When we pray, are we doing something about Manipur? Right. Is prayer any less than a demonstration on the street? If we spend time in prayer, is prayer any and not as effective as a demonstration. And so I believe that Christians are not quiet. We are doing something because we believe in the power of prayer. And so maybe it's an encouragement for us that we continue to pray. And uh, we ask the Holy Spirit to remind us that we pray for situations like this because we are doing something when we pray because we believe in a God who will intervene. Of course, we, know, we don't know when and how, and we just have to trust God in that. I just noticed that uh, Sunday school, uh, I was just hoping that we could bless them before they go. Is it okay to just call them back and we can bless them? <laughs> right. okay. um, as, they, as the little kids come, um, uh, just this morning, uh, preparing to come to worship. Uh, yeah, well, let's, let's pray for them before they go for. We'd like to pray for them. Uh, they are very much part of our congregation. And uh, so join me, congregation, as we pray. Loving Father, we just thank you for these children who are so precious for their parents and for us as uh, a congregation. We want to ask your very special blessings upon them as they study your word. And of course, pr we commit uh, Selena into your hands and pray that you will guide her and lead her and g continue to provide a good foundation for these children to grow in. We commit them into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Enjoy Bible study. Did I hear a him? Amen from the children? Yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I was just mentioning that uh, I was just preparing to go and I got a message. Uh, this is from Dr. Eugene Guzon. You probably remember he visited us at least on two occasions or three occasions. And uh, he now is the former superintendent of uh, Asia. Uh, I've worked with him for almost four years and never realized that uh, he was grooming me to take his role. And uh, he continues to be uh, the national director for the Philippine Church, but he's also training another man called Audi Santibanus, who will take over as national director uh, in January of 24. So he's slowly moving towards a complete retirement. So uh, he sent me a message. I wanted to share it with you. Hello, Danny. Have an inspiring weekend 
and please convey my love to our brethren there. I am attending my home church today. Regards to Mary. So she, uh, he sends this. So I did tell him that I will mention it to the brethren that he has uh, remembered you. Uh, he's a he's a very uh, loving man, and uh, it was um, challenging working with him, but he was also <laughs> a very interesting person. Lovely to see some of you. It's good to see Swarna uh, all the way from Vijayawada. <laughs> And of course, uh, I haven't seen uh, Shashi after we got back from our trip. So Jason and Shashi, thank you so much for joining us. I hope our little one is okay uh, in the UK. All right. All right, let me just... Um, all right, uh, you have uh, witnessed the scripture reading and this is a very strange story, isn't it? Can you imagine uh, this event that Jacob wrestles with this unidentified man? Who is this person, you know? And of course, later Jacob recognizes or at least comes to realization who he is. But we were going to look at the strange event in the Bible Part of it was given to us by Kara Garrity, who uh, spoke on speaking of life. But a wrestling match, a kusti <laughs> in the Bible, and we are going to see what this kusti means, hopefully learn a few lessons. But it would seem very bizarre, right? Of course, we have, uh, we have been, uh, I mean, the, the, the unidentified person is identified as God. No, I don't know how to take that, but can you imagine God wrestling with Jacob? Uh, the first thing it comes to mind is, is this a fair contest? Can you win against a kusti with God? <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, you notice that towards the end of the story, uh, you know, when Jacob was not letting go of this man, uh, this uh, this person uh, dislocates the hip. <laughs> I don't know what he does, but the hip gets dislocated. If he can dislocate a hip, can you win a wrestling match with this person? Obviously, you know, it, there is something strange about it. Uh, is God trying to show how much strong he is? Uh, obviously not, you know, uh, there is no match. Uh, but there is an important lesson for us and I'm hoping that we can pick up a few thoughts and what I want to bring home to us especially from uh, from our understanding that we have been led into uh, after our reformation uh, that we come to know God more clearly than much than before right we are constantly in GCI asking the question, who? The who question is very important in our theology. Who is this God? The reason we need to know God first is because you only then know who is humankind because God created humankind, right? Uh, you, you don't start with human beings and that is the that is the uh, quest of psychology and humanistic research. We are all trying to understand who we are as human beings. But God is out of the picture. They don't, they don't believe that there, uh, there is a God who exists. They believe in evolution or they believe in may, maybe other ways of manic, mankind existing. But we believe, am I getting a him? A hum rather. Uh, Vijay, if you can just help me. Uh, I'm getting a hum. I'm not sure why. Uh, but we believe that God created man. So who should you know first to understand us, ourselves? Do we understand us before we understand the creator? No, we believe there is a creator. So in GCI, we constantly ask the question, who is this God that we worship? And that's a very important question to ask. Uh, we want to know 
we will know us ourselves better when we know who God is because we are broken human beings we see it we just spoke about Manipur why is that happening can a humanist answer can a psychologist answer why do human beings behave like that can you imagine human beings I mean you can't even say they are worse than animals because don't undermine animals animals are so much more peaceful human beings are so corrupted and depraved can any psychologist answer that we have an answer from the Bible human beings are broken they are corrupted because we have a story in the Bible that tells us why and so we continue to ask the question who is this God that we worship so that we can understand ourselves better so to go back to the story we must understand the context a little bit was given in the speaking of life let me flesh it out a little bit more Jacob is the son of Isaac and uh, Rebecca right right Rebecca <laughs> I have to go back to Sunday school some of these uh, uh, some of these uh, things you know miss your mind but Jacob everybody knows who is he what kind of a person is he man he's a he's a thief <laughs> Uh, he cheated his elder brother not elder brother they are twins but he <laughs> elder one came out first he cheat even cheats his father-in-law of course the father-in-law also cheats him there are a bunch of thieves all these fellows so if you find if you are going to be close to Jacob we must all keep our hands on our pockets because he'll pick your pocket <laughs> I'm just exaggerating a bit but but here is Jacob, elder, uh, supposedly elder son, birthright. Um, uh, to, you know, the, the elder one normally gets the birthright to inherit a double portion. And yet this man comes and cheats him of that. He was also supposed to get the blessing. That also he gets cheated on. Right? So Jacob is a very interesting character. His, his name Jacob means supplanter. Or to put it more, uh, you know, of course, uh, he, it also means to grab another's heel. And that's how he came out of the womb, isn't it? By grabbing the, uh, Esau's heel. Literally speaking, it means uh, to take something that belongs to somebody else. So that is the kind of a person that he is, Jacob, right? Okay, let's, I'm not going to go the whole story, but let's fast forward to the time when he is going to meet Esau. He, he is told that Esau, the elder fellow who was cheated, is coming with 400 men. And suddenly his heart skips a beat. Right? He is scared out of his pants because he knows that maybe this fellow is coming to take revenge on him. Okay? Esau knows that he was cheated and now that he's coming with 400 men is it possible that he's going to come and you know slaughter these people finally Jacob's deceit and lies catches up with him he is now face to face with danger all right uh, so he's afraid he's terribly afraid what does he do when he's afraid he prays for protection. <laughs> he suddenly goes to God and says, God, help, please help. Right? Um, and how does he pray? He's reminding God, God, didn't you promise my fathers this all this great blessing? Now, why don't you protect your servant? <laughs> right? He doesn't tell God, God, I'm a cheat. <laughs> you know? Of course, he does say something about, you know, you have been kind to me. But he's reminding God of his promises while he is not, he's trying to nicely cover up all his problems, right? And keep it on the side. So he prays. And then what does he do? His trickery doesn't go away from him yet. <laughs> he knows 400 men are coming. Esau is also riding with them. They probably all have swords. He knows this is going to be a tough one. 
he sends his servants and all his animals before him right he says these servants take these animals you go before him and when esau comes you tell him you know my master has asked to give you all this now why would he do that you see because if esau started killing he'll start killing there first right <laughs> and this man has time to run away so here again he's trying to do his tricks right and then what does he do of course the night comes he sends maybe two camps ahead of him animals servants uh, hoping that these will be the buffer zone <laughs> protection against slaughter then the night comes and as we have read uh, he and his wives cross the river jebok why does he cross a river <laughs> because once the slaughter starts if he that's what he's thinking and then esau comes this man on the other side of the river jacob will know that these guys are coming to hit on us so they'll give us more time to run away <laughs> right by the time they cross the river maybe they'll have more time to run away so uh he for safety sake he crosses the river and then he spends the night or at least he begins the night waiting when the problem will start and maybe as he dozed off suddenly this strange event we are only told uh a man i unidentified a man comes and maybe jacob is wondering he's come to rob him maybe he tries to catch him and then the wrestling starts right this unidentified man starts wrestling with jacob who could this man be well the bible is sometimes you feel you needed more information right but the bible is silent and so we <laughs> we have to be careful what we say but jacob thankfully gives us a clue we'll come to that a little later right So the wrestling takes place and it says the wrestling takes place all night. I mean that is just amazing, you know, all night. Jacob through his res- wrestling comes to understand that this, this is no ordinary person, right? This person is wrestling but he is not winning or at least you could say he's not allowing Jacob to completely overpower him. he allows jacob to continue to push against him right and so jacob began to perceive something this person is no ordinary person right this unidentified man is not letting or not winning which he could have done very easily and allowing jacob to continue in the match then what happens let let's pick up the story in in uh, uh verse 26 it says then the man said let me go for it is daybreak but jacob replied i will not let you go unless you bless me right there you begin to see jacob knew that there is something special about this person you need to bless me he says the man said what is your name jacob he answered jacob means thief chore <laughs> you know um uh, verse 28 then the man said your name will no longer be jacob but israel now what is the significance of a name change well, we'll come to that in a little later right because it says you have struggled with god wow <laughs> you have a, a clue here you have struggled with god and with humans and have overcome Jacob said please tell me your name but he replied why do you ask my name and there again blank 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 no information we just don't know right sometimes you wish the bible had a little bit more <laughs> but you don't then he blessed him there so the man blessed him there Jacob 
uh, called the place Peniel, saying it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. In those times, they used to believe that if you see God, you will be dead. You cannot see God. And that's why most of the Jews, when they pray, they will not look at, you know, they will, they will not look at, uh, uh, let's say, the Holy of Holies. Uh, they will not look straight. They're always bowing their head. And I remember a, a professor in Ambassador College when, when I was studying there, his name was Mark Kaplan. And he was a, a, a very devout Jew, but became a Christian. And he was a professor in our college. And when he used to talk, he used to always look away. You know, he's talking to you, but he's looking somewhere else. And you know, sometimes I feel the habit of not looking directly into a person's face because of what they learned. You don't look at God because you'll die. All right. So, um, uh, this is identified as God. Who could it be? Any guesses? From what we then, if you fast forward right into the New Testament, who could it be? Could it be the second person of the Trinity? Some, bi some Bibles identify as an angel of the Lord. You know, angel of the Lord, that term is very special. It's not given to anybody and everybody or any angel. The angel of the Lord, right? Could it be? What we, whom we know now as Jesus. We don't know. We, we can only speculate, right? So, uh, what then are the lessons that we can learn, right? We've just gone through all of this. And remember what I said earlier? We are learning who is this God. And I believe this story reveals a little bit about who this God is from whom Jesus Christ re revealed. You remember Jesus said, I have come to reveal my Father. We know Christ, we know God only through Jesus. There is no other way you can know God, but only through Jesus. And uh, what do we know about God from this particular story? And if you put it along with what, how Jesus revealed him, we begin to see something very, very interesting in my estimation. One we can understand is, who did he come to? Jacob. And who was Jacob? A donga, you know, a thief, <laughs> a pickpocketer, you know, a fellow who cheated people. And yet God did not abandon him. We sometimes think, oh, God will not look at sin. Oh, God will not even look at somebody who is perverse and corrupt. No. This God is willing to engage even with an absolute sinner. God doesn't abandon us when, you know, we struggle with our own weaknesses. Though he was a rotten thief, God comes to him, right? And he wants to fulfill his purpose through this thief called Jacob. But through that encounter, God is able to transform him. And we will see that transformation as we go down a little bit. So we can ask ourselves the question, how do you feel about yourself? And I think if you're honest, you and I can say that, you know, I'm not worthy of this God. We can say that, yes, I am struggling all the time. Not only in action, but mostly in my thoughts, I struggle. I wish I didn't have the, you know, the struggle with my, the way I think and maybe put down other people or having corrupt thoughts. Uh, but God's love for us is not diminished because we are corrupt. God's love never stops because of our corruption. God's love is a pursuing God, as Kara was telling us in the uh, video. He pursues us in spite of our sins. He comes after you. I still remember Joseph Dikach Sr., our previous pastor general, as we used to call him, used to tell us in his sermons, 
when you don't feel close to God, ask the question, who moved? When you don't feel close to God, ask the question, who moved? Has God moved away from you? No. God doesn't move away from you. He doesn't abandon you. We have those famous words, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God never leaves. It is we who have moved. We feel alienated because we have moved. That is what happened to Adam and Eve. They are the ones who moved away from God. Not God. God came pursuing after them. And yet they were feeling ashamed because they moved away. And many a times we would feel that way. And we must resist the temptation on thinking that God has abandoned us. He hasn't. I have this interesting verse from the book of Isaiah. Notice once again how God thinks. I want us to understand who is this God? Remember who? The who question. Who is this? How does he think? Notice he says in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 8. This is talking about Israel. Israel had abandoned God. They have gone into paganism. They stopped obeying him. And God comes and says, come. Come now, let us settle the matter. God is interested in settling things. Do we like to settle things? No, we like to f things to fester. But God is not like that. He comes to settle, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. God is saying, I am willing to clean you up. I am... I am willing to give you what you need in terms of your complete transformed life. But here is the problem, verse 19 in the same chapter of Isaiah. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Wow, that's a very, very powerful word. We must take note. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. We don't take that lightly. If God has spoken, let us be. What God is saying is, you need to cooperate with me. If you are constantly going to be, you know, uh, moving away from me, then what, how can I help you? I want to help you. I want to settle matters with you. But do, are you willing? And that's what God is. This is the God we worship. Okay, let's go to the second point. Wrestling match. God engages in a wrestling match. Why? Because God wants that sense of interaction. Dynamic interaction. It's not a wrestling match where God wants to fight with us. No, it's a, a metaphor to help us understand that God wants dynamic interaction. He doesn't want passive, naam ke vaste, you know, uh, what do we say, what kind of a Christian? Uh, nominal Christian. He doesn't like nominalism. <laughs> he wants active, dynamic, you know, interaction with him. Seek him. That's what he wants us to do. Seek him. Come close to him. Struggle with him. Especially in adversity, struggle with him. Because God loves to interact. Right? Why? Because we believe He's a personal God. Right? Uh, he, he likes the personal touch. Why, why the incarnation? Why would He come Himself and become Jesus? The incarnation. He wants that personal touch. He didn't send His secretary. Right? He didn't, he didn't do a Zoom call. He came personally, interacted with us. Right? Recently, somebody asked me the question. We were looking at some of these scriptures and he said, you know, how I wish God did the same thing he did to Jacob and to Moses. He came and spoke and, you know, why doesn't he do that with us? And I said to myself, I said, that's a very interesting question. Why doesn't he do that? Is he not doing that? Do we have eyes to see? Right? Has Jesus Christ come? Has Jesus Christ ascended but still available to us? Has the Holy Spirit come? Has, is the Holy Spirit in us? 
maybe we need to pray, God, show me that you are with me. Right? You know, recently I was reading a book, it's an assigned reading, because for my role I needed to do a class. And uh, the, books, uh, the book uh, asked the question, is God in your, in your worst situation? Has God left you in your worst situation? And the answer is no. He is with us, right? He wants dynamic interaction, right? He wants us to be interacting with him in prayer, in conversation, in worship, in activity. Yes, let's do that because God loves that. All right, let me move to the third point then. The third point is the question that, uh, you know, we, a lot of people can ask, why does God allow Jacob uh, to win? Or you could say not win, but at least not to lose. If God can dislocate his hip, why does he allow Jacob to win? Right? Once again, it is because we worship a God who is a giving God, a loving God. It's like a parent, as we saw in the video, who will play with a child but will deliberately lose just to let the child win. This reminds me of my little interaction with my grandson. <laughs> so we were there for a week, my wife and I, and uh, early morning, you know, we used to come after breakfast, Benjamin, my grandson, said, Say, Grandpa, can we play peekaboo? You know, uh, they call it peekaboo. That means you have to find, you'll go and hide and go and find. And said, okay. I said, I'll count five, you go and hide and I'll catch you. He said, okay, and he'll run off. And he goes to his bedroom, takes the bed sheet and puts it over him. <laughs> and then I come, where is Benjamin? Where is Benjamin? I know where he is. <laughs> He is there sitting on the bed with us. I know where, but I'm acting. Oh, fuck, Benjamin, I can't see you. Where are you, Benjamin? I go look under the table, under, you know, remove the curtain. And Benjamin says, he must be thinking, what grandpa? This, this fool can't, doesn't know I'm here. Maybe I'll help this grandpa. And he rolls the sheet and says, here I am. I say, oh yeah, Benjamin, so wonderful. Oh, there you are. You know, we let little children win, and that's our God. He treats us as children. He wants us to win. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to know that we care, we love Him, right? He will take humiliation to make sure that we are taken care of, we are happy, we are transformed, right? He humbles Himself in the incarnation, even goes to the cross so that we would win. This is the God we worship. Two more points, and then we'll close. Dislocation of the hip, does it have any meaning? Did Jacob limp for the rest of his life? I don't know. In those days, there were no hip operation, hip replacement. I don't know what happened to him. But, uh, but the interesting thought is, uh, Kara mentioned that in the video, that the Jews don't eat the hip muscle out of respect for, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Should we eat the hip muscle? Uh, uh, we'll enjoy it. Uh, but uh, Jacob limped maybe for the rest of his life. Uh, probably always being reminded the day he wrestled with God. Always being reminded this God was so kind enough to come and bless me, transform me. Do you and I have scars in life? Are we, do we have, go through troubles and we are left with a scar? Sometimes physical, sometimes emotional. And maybe, does God leave those scars to remind us that he has not left us? That through those scars he has healed us, he has helped us, he has strengthened us, right? Do you know Jesus carries a scar? Why would he let that scar remain? He tells, who is it, Thomas, right? Come, put your, put your, hand, your fingers here. Why does he, 
Does he need a scar? But why does he leave that scar? Once again, we can only speculate. Maybe just to tell us, help us remind us, to remind us, I love you. I love you so much that I took the nail for you, right? So, uh, scars of life, don't let it make you sad, but help it, let it help you be reminded that there is a God who can work in spite of that scars in our lives. And finally, he gives him a new name. Israel, your name is no more Jacob, which means, Israel means, he who wrestles with God. What does a new name reflect? You know, many times we hear about baptisms and somebody gets baptized and they say, I want a new name now. Right? Why do they take a new name? Right? A new name is symbolic, right, of a changed person, changed character, change or, or a transformed person, right? And you know, God will all, God someday will give us new names. I think that's what the book of Revelation says, right? I wonder <laughs> uh, whether we'll carry our old names or new names, I don't know. But it's a indication of transformation, right? God interacts with us in such a way, finally, he wants to transform us. And a new name is again a reminder that he is the one who's done the cleansing job. We can't cleanse ourselves. We have to allow God to cleanse us. Jesus Christ to cleanse us. Right? He transforms us. How? Into the perfect image of the Son of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. We will become like him. We will take his image. All right? So, to summarize, God through this story is wanting us to know that he never abandons us. God through this story wants us to know that he enjoys engagement. He enjoys dynamic engagement, even wrestling with him in prayer, in conversation. Sometimes in the difficult times, go back to God and wrestle with him. He, he will hold you. He will embrace you. He will encourage you. And God, through this story, shows us how humble he can be. So humble that he lets us win. So humble that he will take a nail for us. He will take a spear for us. So humble that he will wash our feet for us. That's the humility that we have of this God. This God is so great that he will not overlook your scar. If you are nursing a scar, emotional or physical, he knows you have a scar. He will only show his scar and say, I identify with you. I know how you feel. I will help you. Don't worry about that scar. I will strengthen you. Be my disciple. Love others. Even if they're unlovable, love others just as I have loved you. And this God that from this story helps us to understand that he's willing to transform us completely to such an extent where we can have a new name, a new identity, a new birth, a new identity in Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me end by quoting that same scripture of Isaiah chapter 1, so that we are reminded of who this God is. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 8, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. God is committed to transform us, but... Let's not forget what else he says. If you are willing and obedient, verse 19, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth 
of the Lord has spoken. Let us take note. This is the great God we worship. Let us praise Him and trust Him.